the danger, that was a stranger. Preach the word, come on, preach the word. Careful instruction, out of big production. Preach the word, preach the word. We don't need the actress, your man should have tapped you. Preach the word, preach the word. We're on the brink of eternity, please be earnest, please. Preach the word. All right, guys, what time is it? Preach the word. Did you guys know what day it is today? You're just reading that. What is it, Joshy? Easter. Easter. Resurrection Sunday or Easter. And do you guys know why Easter is such a big deal? Because Jesus rose from the dead. And so what I want us to understand, though, is how big of a deal this is. See, guys, Jesus is God, right? The Bible says, John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. Uh, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus, God, uh, specifically the Son of God, okay, God the Son, became a man. And He did that to come save people who couldn't save themselves. So we, had, uh, uh, we were under the uh, dominion of sin and death and Satan. And we had no hope. But Jesus left the glory of heaven to save us. And we celebrate the incarnation when God became a man, okay? God, who doesn't need anything, is all-powerful. Uh, he became, he took on a body, became a man, and, and we celebrate that when? Christmas. Christmas, okay? And so he became, he was born, okay? And guys, it's such a big deal that God became a man that all, we, we divide our time over that. Okay, think about it, Okay? Uh, B.C. is before Christ. Okay, that's in darkness. That's the time where there were promises, but the, it wasn't the time of fulfillment. But then, when Jesus became a man and came here, okay, when God became a man and came here, it's A.D. I think Latin is like Adonai something. You probably know. I know Stomini. Uh, okay, the year of our Lord. See, when God visited the world, it changed everything. And even atheists today, guess what? They write 2020 on their checks. Okay. They might not acknowledge Jesus as God, but guys, he's changed everything, okay? Because when God visited the earth, it's a big deal. But he came, okay, to accomplish something. He came, okay, to save his people from their sins. That's what the angel said to Joseph. Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He came, he said, to die, okay? Uh, he said the Son of Man, okay, did not come to be served. Did Jesus deserve to be served? Yes. But he says, I came to serve. And to give my life as a ransom for many. See, Jesus came to satisfy God's wrath for us. He came to live a perfect life and then die and take the punishment for sins we deserve. That's what he did. He came to accomplish redemption. And, and, but he's still God. So that's why he said in John, he said, I, nobody takes my life from me, but I give it. Uh, I, I lay it down for my sheep. And so the point is this, guys. Jesus died, but then he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And his resurrection is different than any other resurrection we read about in the Bible. Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave, didn't he? Mm -hmm. But Lazarus died again. Jesus rose from the dead never to die again. He's still alive. Jesus is alive. alive. So, and, the, and that's what we celebrate. Not just this day, but all. Every Lord's Day, hopefully. And that's what I want us to understand today. See, you guys might not understand this, but uh, it is difficult. Just to see how big of a deal Jesus is, it is difficult to get religious people to change. Like, you can't hardly change the color of the carpet in a church without infighting and strife, and let alone you start talking about traditions, okay? And again, whether the traditions are good or bad, okay? Um, but singing hymns instead of praise songs, or uh, 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 having an altar call or invitation at the end of a sermon. See, traditions could be good, whatever, but the point is, is if you try to change those, Guys, they don't, that's hard to change. And the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt sing hymns, does it? And yet those traditions are strong. Okay, And, and, and the point is, is, there's good reasons why people have some traditions. But anyway, the, my point is this. From creation until about 36 AD, God's people worshipped on the seventh day. And then after 36 AD, God's people worshipped on the first day. It completely changed. And does the Bible say that the Sabbath is to be honored and worshipped on the seventh day? It does, okay? And so God's Word says it's the seventh day, but Jesus' resurrection is such a big deal, guys, that it changes the day the church gathers for worship. And there's not even any debate about it in the New Testament. 
They debated circumcision, all kinds of other things, but they didn't debate this because they understood what the resurrection meant. So I want us to understand this. So let's look at a couple texts, okay? So remember when we studied the fourth commandment? Fourth commandment is what? Remember the Sabbath. Here it is. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is Exodus 20. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do, you shall not do any work, nor your maidservants or your ox or your donkey, and all that kind of stuff. It goes on. The point is, is when God saved Israel out of Egypt, He gave them, okay, the Ten Commandments. What are the Ten Commandments sometimes called? God's moral law. That's God's commandments that apply to all people of all places, at all times. And so, one of those commandments was this right here, okay? Now, I want to focus on a certain word there. Remember the Sabbath, okay? So when God says remember the Sabbath, if I asked Brandon Shell and Hazel Whittle, and I said, you guys remember your wedding? What would they say? No. Well, how could you forget your wedding day? It never happened. You can't remember something that hasn't happened. So when God says, remember the Sabbath day, what does that mean? It's, happened. it's already happened. See, next one. Okay. In fact, the next verse he says, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Okay. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. He set it apart. So God, six days he worked and made the earth. Okay. And then the seventh day he rested. Was he tired? How do you know he wasn't tired? He's never tired? God's never tired. In fact, every time you sleep, it should be a reminder, there's a God, and I ain't him, because God doesn't get tired. Right? You get tired, I get tired, it's because we're not God. Okay? But God doesn't get tired, so why did he rest? To set a pattern for us. So if we go back to Genesis 2, okay, and think, of, I want to emphasize all this, how it's about, go on, how it, God has, has finished his work, and so there's, it's connected to being him resting. He finished. He rested. Genesis 1 ends with it saying, God looked at all that he had made, okay, in the six days, and it says, and behold, it was all very good, okay, and thus there was morning and evening, the sixth day. And then it says this, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, okay, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. Next one. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. See, I want you guys to understand is God, okay, he, he created everything. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But there was, it was formless and void. And so for six days, he brought order to the world. Go to the next one. Okay, so what happened is God created, Genesis 1-1 and 2, and then he brought order to it. He made light and darkness. He separated the waters above from the waters below. He made the seas. He made the trees that bear fruit like bananas and pears and apples. Okay? And he, he made the sun, the moon, the stars. He made fish of the sea, birds of the air. He made the beasts of the ground and the livestock. And then at the very end, the pinnacle, he made human, human beings in the image of God. And, and so he did all that. He brought order to what he had made, okay? Uh, the, the Bible, I don't have time to develop it, but the Bible describes the whole world is, is like a temple where God is going to be with his people, okay? And so God creates the temple, he brings order to this temple, and then he rests. He's, it's actually, he's enthroned as well, this is part of the idea of it. But the point is, uh, uh, he's done, okay? He's brought order to it. Now, he gives then a task for his uh, uh, the, the one who's made in his image. Okay, So look at what it says. Adam, he's placed in a garden. And the garden of Eden is referred to as a temple as well. Okay, In Ezekiel 28. And so this garden temple, Adam is placed in it. And he's commanded to be fruitful. He's commanded to multiply. To bring order so that the garden, where, where Adam walked with God, or God walked with them, I should say. And so this garden... Adam and Eve are, are supposed to fill the entire earth so that the whole earth would become this temple, okay? Uh, uh, and they're to fill the earth with the glory of God. And then the idea is, is when Adam finishes his work, just like God, when God finished his work, what did he do? He rested. When Adam finishes his work, he can enter the rest of God, okay? Next one. And so let's look at Adam. Adam is the first man, okay? 
He's called the Son of God. In uh, Luke 3, 38, going through the genealogy of Jesus, says Seth is the son of Adam, and Adam was the son of God. Okay? Adam was the... Uh, uh, was a prophet. He, he, if they're going to fill the earth, he would have to declare God's word to his offspring. He was a priest, uh, just like the priests were commanded to, to, to guard and keep the, the temple. That's what Adam was to do the garden. Same words, guard and keep. Okay? He was a king to rule over the creation. So Adam was a prophet, priest, and king. And he was to be fruitful and fill the earth with the image of God. How did Adam do? Failed. Next. Failed. He He failed. Right? He ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He sinned against God. And so he, Romans 5 says, uh, uh, he, because we're all in him, he, he brought all mankind into sin and death. Okay? And Adam all died. Right? Uh, and so the point is, that's why we, I, I say all the time, is our problem isn't that we're good people who mess up sometimes. Our problem is that we're sinners. We're not good. And that's why we do bad things. Right? Because we're born into sin. That's why you don't need to be taught how to lie. You need to be taught how to tell the truth. You don't need to be taught how to be selfish. It comes naturally because we're sinners. Because in Adam, all die. In Adam, there's condemnation and death and sin. And so that's where we are in Adam. Now, go to the next one. Jesus then comes along and he's called the last Adam. Okay? He's called the second man. He's also called the Son of God. You see the parallels? He's also, I don't think I have to develop this, he is the prophet the priest, and the king, right? He came to save his people from their sin, which includes forgiveness, but also recreates us after the likeness of God in righteousness and truth, Ephesians 4. And so the point is, is he came to save his people from their sin to recreate us and fill the earth with the image of God. You see, he's, he's making this world into a temple, okay, of God, where man and God will dwell together. You can read about it in Revelation 20. Uh, 22, but the point, 21, 22, but the point is this, guys, he's, he came to do that. Now, how did Jesus do? He succeeded. He came and has accomplished the redemption. He lived a perfect life, and he, he died and paid the penalty to satisfy God's wrath, to buy us and then redeem us. And so in Christ, then, Romans 5, all live, okay? He, and Hebrews 2 says he's brought many sons uh, into glory. And so the point is this, before we move on, this is going to be a little bit longer, but it's Easter, okay? Um, the point is this, the most important thing about you guys isn't what college you go to, isn't how successful you are in business or uh, uh, in uh, uh, sports or anything like that. The most important thing about you and me and anybody who might be watching is are you in Adam or are you in Christ? See, how do you get to be in Adam? You get born as a human being. If you're born a human being, you were born into sin and death and condemnation. Okay? You're in Adam. How do you get to be in Christ? You get born again. You get born again. Right? And the evidence that you've been born again is that you have faith in Christ. When you're connected to Jesus, you're now in Christ. And there's not condemnation, but there's justification. There's not death, but there's life. There's not sin, but there's righteousness in Christ. And so that, that's the thing. Are you in Christ? Are you trusting Him? Now, that's what Jesus came to do, and He succeeded. So now go to the next one. Okay? And this is exactly what the Bible says explicitly in Hebrews 4, verse 9 and 10. It says this, So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. You could translate that, There remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. But understand, guys, understand a Sabbath keeping isn't rules. Okay? A Sabbath keeping is this. God accomplished a divine act, creation, and then he rested. And out of the, the, the work, the divine work that God did, God's old covenant church was to rest on the seventh day. They were to keep the Sabbath, okay? Uh, as, as rest for their physical bodies and to point them back to Jesus, point them back to God, to Yahweh, uh, every seventh day. And so in the new covenant, it's the same way. Jesus has accomplished a divine work of recreation. And so he's rested. And so as New Covenant people, okay, we have a Sabbath keeping, but it's based on what? The foundation of what Christ has done. And so every first day, every Sunday, we gather together, and it's rest for our bodies, but it's also to point our souls back to Christ, back to the hero who has come to save us. 
and to be reminded of what he's done for us. Okay? But then he goes on. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And, the, and why? For the one who has entered his rest, we're going to talk about who that is, has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. So the one who has entered his rest has himself rested from his work as God did. So the point is God, God, guys, is the pattern. God has done a divine work, and after he accomplishes divine work, he is rested. You see that? Now, God has in the, uh, 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 this one who has, has entered, his, it's a parallel, it's Jesus. Jesus is the one who has entered his rest. He's accomplished a divine work, and now he enters his rest. Okay, so let's, let's break it down. See the parallel. So God created, that's his divine work. He created in six days. He was satisfied with his work. So what did he do? He rested, okay? Jesus did recreation, okay? And he accomplished it not through creation, but he accomplished it through redemption, through suffering obedience, through living a perfect life that we should live but don't, and then dying to pay the penalty we deserve, to satisfy God's wrath on our behalf. And so he did that. He was satisfied with his work. And so what has he done? He's entered his rest. When did he do that? At the resurrection. Okay, up from the grave he rose. Okay, and that's what happened. Okay, he's resurrected. He's that's like the receipt. God has, God has received the payment for sin, and guys, he's accomplished it. He's done it. He, and that's why he sits down. Okay, at the ascension, the ascension and the resurrection are very closely linked. He's sat down. Why? Because he's done working. He's accomplished his divine work. Okay, go on to the next one. Okay, and so if you break this into theological terms, okay, and it just helps us to do that. The covenant of creation, also called the covenant of works. But in the garden, you had that covenant of creation. And what it was, was the Sabbath was the seventh day, right? The end of the week. What day is that? Saturday. And so you work six days and then you rest, okay? But in the new covenant, we could call it the covenant of re recreation, or typically we would call it the new covenant, the covenant Christ has inaugurated, Okay, this one, the Sabbath is now the first day of the week. Okay, which is what day? Sunday. Sunday. Well, okay, and so what we do as Christians is we, on the first day, we don't work and then rest. We rest in the finished work of Christ on Sunday. We gather, although it's a bit different this Easter with all the uh, pandemic stuff. Okay, but we gather with God's people on the first day of the week corporately. We tune our hearts to Christ, to what he's done for us, and worship him because he's the king who deserves all our praise and glory. And, and then we rest in what he's done for us, things we could never do for ourselves. And then the rest of the week, out of what he's done for us, we serve and work for him. Not to earn anything with him, but out of gratitude. It's just like the law. We say this all the time. The law okay, is a burden apart from Christ. The law is a burden, and it leads to death. The law is supposed to bring us to Jesus, to say we can't keep the law. But when the law brings us to Jesus, we trust in Jesus. What does Jesus do? He sends us back to the law because it's through keeping the law that's the fulfillment of love. Okay, And so we go back and out of what Christ has done for us, we serve him out of gratitude and thanksgiving uh, for what he's done. And so that, that's what we see. So, And you guys know this. That's why I love the catechism. Okay? After we looked at the fourth commandment, it says this. What day of the week is the Christian Sabbath? Don't answer it yet. What day of the week is the Christian Sabbath? The first day of the week called? The first day of the week called the Lord's Day. And it quotes the two passages. That's what it's called. Now guys, every day is, belongs to the Lord. But the first day of the week is the Lord's Day in a special way. Okay, and then why is it called the Lord's Day? Because on that day, Go ahead. Because on that day Christ rose from the dead, and it gives the quote in every gospel narrative. So the point is this, guys: the resurrection, okay, is such a huge thing. It changed the day we worship God. Okay, so go to the next one. So we, as the people of God, have every, we start every week by observing the Sabbath and being reminded. Of our hero. Who's our hero? Jesus. The one who did for us what we can't do for ourselves. We're reminded of our hero's triumph over sin and death in his resurrection. He rose from the dead, guys. 
defeated Satan, defeated death, defeated sin. Guys, we're set free because of that. And so when we understand that, guys, that should grow, help us to grow in our love for Christ and what He's done for us. So let's pray that even though this Easter is a bit different, we can't gather with uh, uh, the people we love and normally corporately gather together, we can still worship Christ for His, His work on the cross, and we can grow in our understanding of it. That'll help us grow in our love for Him. So let's pray and ask God to give us grace to do that. Dear God, we thank You for Easter. Help us to better understand and grow in our understanding of what Christ has done for us. And help us to, in light of that, uh, live our lives for, for your glory and honor like we should. And we pray all these things in Jesus' good name. Amen.